prison in Ireland, you are given your belongings in a clear plastic bag. Walk down the North Circular Road in Dublin's north side, where Mountjoy Prison is located, any given morning, and you'll see men and women carrying them. A clear plastic bag filled with books, letters, clothes, photos, their possessions, on view for the world to, sh to see. A final mark of shame, perhaps, or a badge of honor. Depends on the point of view, theirs or ours. In 2007, I walked out the gates of Mountjoy Prison, not carrying a clear plastic bag, but certainly carrying luggage, valuables of my own, things that I hadn't brought in with me three years previously. So what was in my bag? Skills, certainly. My three years had taught me the mechanics of my job as a probation officer. Knowledge, yes. I was infinitely more attuned to the nature of the work, the clientele, their needs, the challenges of reintegration. But I had also gained insight, admiration, and gratitude. Why? Because the people that I met in Mount Joy took a risk. They let me see not just their paths to imprisonment, their disadvantaged backgrounds, their prison life, but they let me see their story. They showed me, they, sh they let me see their story. They showed me that this was just one part of their story and not the whole part or the most important part, just one part. Let me introduce you to Brian. I started working with Brian after I'd left Mountjoy Prison. I was a probation officer in the community, working with persistent offenders, men who had spent most of their adult life in prison. When I met Brian, he was 36 and coming to the end of a five-year prison sentence. Brian was, this wasn't Brian's first time in prison. However, um, he had spent most of his 20s and 30s in and out of prison, serving short sentences for the sale and supply of drugs. This was, however, Brian's first long sentence, and more crucially, the first time that he had engaged with the therapeutic services within the prison setting. That engagement had allowed Brian the opportunity to reflect on who he was, make sense of who he wanted to be, reflect on the harm that had caused by his criminality. Myself and Brian met on a number of occasions before his release from prison, and those interviews allowed us to develop our therapeutic relationship, the essence of what we do in probation, the foundations for our work in the future. Brian identified his parents as his primary motivating factor in his desire to change his behavior. Brian's parents were elderly, and he had developed an awareness of how negatively any future criminality he committed would impact on them physically and emotionally. Brian had also developed an awareness of his own mortality, his lost opportunities, and a fear of spending any more time in prison. Brian talked of the shame that he felt as a result of the crimes that he had committed, and how that feeling of shame was a driving force in his desire to change. He told me a story of how, prior to this sentence of imprisonment, he had taken drugs for a long time, but his drug use had escalated to such an extent that he had injected in front of his parents. That was a turning point. For him, he had crossed a line, and he knew he needed to make significant changes and choices. On the face of it, Brian's situation coming out of prison was a positive one. He had stable accommodation with his parents, familial support, he was drug-free, and he was engaging with probation supervision. Probation supervision allowed him the opportunity to address issues such as his offending behavior, his education, his addiction, areas which, if left unaddressed, may lead to reoffending or imprisonment. Brian demonstrated a motivation to change and a willingness to take a different and difficult path 
I was optimistic about Brian's potential for reintegration and of his genuine desire to live a crime-free life. However, I was also aware of the 20 odd years that Brian had spent in and out of prison, using and selling drugs, and of the significant difficulties he would face in going down that different path. So, Brian came out of prison and he encountered few difficulties with staying away from drugs, with maintaining positive family relationships, with attending his appointments. However, Brian encountered a different pressure. He struggled and faced on a daily basis the challenge of living on the basic social welfare payment of less than 200 euros a week. You see, Brian had lived a lavish lifestyle selling drugs. Money had been no object for him. And that was an easy path for him to go back to, one which he had regular offers of from past acquaintances, only too delighted for him to, to continue that way. And when Brian declined their offers, he described seeing the status and the material possessions associated with that lifestyle disappear for him. But only for him, they were still evident amongst his peers. So myself and Brian worked devising excuses which he could employ when he met an old friend and he needed to avoid them but not offend them, because those people still lived in his community, a community within which he needed to reintegrate. My work with Brian not only required a practical problem-solving approach, we needed to dig down. We needed to explore the, the lifestyle that he felt he had lost, the effects of his drug dealing. And in examining and analyzing the significance of those effects or items, Brian heightened his resolve not to return to drug dealing, to achieve the goals that he had set himself and to make himself and his family proud. Trying to atone for past behaviours can sometimes have unintended consequences. Brian's family saw him flourish and excel. He was getting up every morning, he was attending appointments, he was back in education, and the guards weren't calling at the door anymore. However, maintaining that view of himself took work and was a burden. Brian spoke to me of the pressure he felt and of the failures that came about following that. The days when he strayed back into that old lifestyle, looking to revisit the rewards he believed that he had relinquished. Brian, to his credit, trusted that I would be able to balance the two seemingly opposing roles of a probation officer, care and control. He trusted that I would care by listening and empathizing to the pressures that he was feeling and that I wouldn't penalize him for his openness in discussing his setbacks. On the days when Brian's determination and resolve would falter, he required support to get back on track. I would remind him of his successes, of his capacity to achieve his goals, and of the opportunities that he had at his disposal to live a crime-free life. You see, probation practice enshrined the importance of believing in the person and the possibility of change. For me, Brian displayed courage on a daily basis when he faced these challenges. He kept going. He was the epitome of Samuel Beckett's quote, try again, fail again, fail better. I'm pleased to say Brian finished his probation supervision and during those two years, he achieved many of the goals that he set for himself. He has been out of the criminal justice system for over a decade. And I recently bumped into Brian in Dublin city centre where he was working for a homeless charity we stopped and chatted, and he told me of how far his life had come, how high he had risen, and where he was now. And in listening to Brian, I realized that he had shifted in real terms, but also in how he now saw himself, no longer the offender and addict, now simply a father and employee. Brian talked of the calmness that he felt in his life, free from the frenetic lifestyle that's associated with criminal criminality. 
And that change in perception of self had allowed Brian to make sense of his life, to recreate another identity, to distance himself from the past and to lead a law-abiding future. Brian told me that a big part of that change for him was the idea that he could pay back or make amends for the harm that he had caused. And hence, on that day, he was helping a homeless charity. This idea of paying back or rep reparation is, can be seen in another story, Tommy. Tommy was a long history of thefts, or more precisely, pickpocketing. But he told me of the pride that he felt amongst his peers at being known and well-respected as a pickpocket or a dipper. And Tommy was given the opportunity to change the sense of identity when he became a father for the first time. And he could change from being a dipper to a father. And one day he came into my office and he was beaming ear to ear, his smile was that wide. And he told me of how he had been walking into the office behind a lady and her bag was open. And he told me that the first instinct thought that he had was to take the wallet out of the top. But he stopped and he took a breath and he tapped the lady on the shoulder and he told her of the risk to her belongings. This allowed him to make good and allowed him to see the benefits that come from doing the right thing. This idea of paying back or reparation is important in the process of change and reform, but it can't happen unless individuals are reintegrated back into our society, our neighborhoods, our workforces, our education systems. And genuine reintegration can't happen without the belief in the potential for redeemability. The idea that we're not a fixed human character and that even the worst behaved of us has something positive to offer society. To paraphrase Shad Maruna, a well-known criminologist, reintegration isn't just for them, it's for us too. A society that forgives well, and by that I mean carefully, purposefully setting out reachable targets that an individual must achieve to redeem themselves, and holding out hope that every person can redeem themselves, is a good society. It's also a safer society. Thank you. <laughs>